Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started back here in Chapter 2. So hopefully we'll be wrapping Chapter 2 up today and getting into Chapter 3 uh, on Wednesday. I'll be posting the Chapter 3 slides later today. Uh, we're only going to cover through Section 5, and we'll talk a little bit when we get to Chapter 3. We're going to skip a topic in Section 5 also altogether in the course. Uh, but we're going to get through um, the topics we're going to cover in Section 5 for Midterm 1 next week. We'll pick up with the remaining two sections, Section 6 and 7 from Chapter 3, when we get back after uh, Midterm 1 next week. So that's what we had to look forward to. Um, so let's get into ionic compounds and some naming uh, conventions for those types of compounds here today. And then also get through some other categories of compounds like acids, hydrocarbons, alcohols, um, and just one other comp compound we'll see, things like CO2 that we call um, a uh, binary compound. We'll talk about naming those as well. And so for an ionic compound, how we're going to recognize these compounds is they generally and almost always will contain a metal. Um, so we'll have something like sodium and then paired up with something like chlorine, so a non-metal. So you see a mixture of metal and non-metallic elements. Um, and then what you can imagine is that sodium has 11 electrons. If you just think of a sodium atom by itself, it would have 11 electrons. It's element number 11 on the periodic table. So 11 protons, 11 electrons. Uh, chlorine's element number 17, so we have 17 protons. We'd have a match of 17 electrons for that atom as well. But it turns out that what makes the noble gases especially stable is that noble gas configuration or count of electrons. So neon having 10 electrons, argon having 18 electrons. That specific count of electrons are where those noble gases get their stability from. That's why those atoms exist as monoatomic gases. They're not forming compounds with other elements or, or even themselves. That's why we call them noble gases. Uh, but sodium's right next to, to neon or right after neon. So sodium can lose an electron, go to a plus charge, go to its cation. So it loses an electron down to 10. And it doesn't lose the electron into thin air. It loses it specifically to chlorine. So it can go to chlorine minus, picking up that extra electron. So chlorine minus is the, the negative ion here. Sodium plus is the positive ion. That's our cation. And so then once these um, ions form, they then have their electrostatic forces of attraction that are so strong that you get like a three-dimensional array of plus minus, plus minus repeating throughout the structure. And so we get the alternating repeating of charges where you have that very strong electrostatic force of attraction. Uh, physicists would use Coulomb's law, talk about kappa Q1, Q2 divide by D. Um, so our energy of electrostatic attraction, this is an equation that we talk about a lot. We never plug numbers into it. It's always a thought that we use this. We have like a kappa um, for a uh, uh, constant Q1, Q2 divide by D. This equation here is kind of telling us that our energy is going to be attraction when we have alternate charges. So we have a plus minus minus plus interaction. The energy is going to go downward for that interaction. If you imagine having two positively charged ions, two sodiums would repel. That energy would go upward and we'd have repulsion. So the energy of electrostatic um, interaction is going downward for oppositely charged particles. That's good. So that's those particles being held together. So sodium chloride exists because we make a cation that's relatively easy to make. We make an anion that's relatively easy to make. And then once they're made, they have an electrostatic attraction with each other. This becomes a topic that we'll talk a lot about in chapter seven and eight on kind of some of the energies that correspond with those types of reactions for ionization. Um, and then how we put that all together for the compound. So we'll come back to talking about some numbers in terms of like the delta H's for this type of process when we get later into the uh, class. But for here, what we're just seeing is that once you make the plus and the minus, they kind of stay stuck together. Um, sodium chloride would have a sort of strong like high melting point if we think about it. That's a chapter 12 topic due to the strong electrostatic force of attraction. What we want to understand here in chapter two is just how can we look at the position of elements in the periodic table, like the sodium group, we're going to see those always form plus charge cations when they form ionic compounds. So sodium, potassium, rubidium, those are always going to plus. They never form a plus two or a plus three uh, when they pair up with a nonmetal to make an ionic compound. The next group of elements, the magnesium group, magnesium, calcium, beryllium doesn't really form too many ionic compounds, so we don't talk too much about beryllium. But magnesium on downward in that group, the alkaline group, those form plus twos because magnesium's like two electrons away from the count of 10, so it can lose two electrons. So our next slide. 
our, our next slide is kind of showing us that we get these common ions, that the alkali group form plus one is their common and only ion that they form uh, when they form ionic compounds. Hydrogen can form a plus one charged ion as well. It's not a metal, so we tend not to group it with the alkalis, but hydrogen only has one electron. So neutral hydrogen, one proton, one electron. And it can lose that one electron to go to the net charge of plus from its one proton. And then oh, we have our alkaline group that we're talking about, plus twos. The plus three column really just has one atom that actually behaves like a metal to form ionic compounds, that's aluminum. Gallium, I guess, could do this, but it tends to form more molecular type compounds where we have shared electrons as opposed to actual charges being shared, like aluminum forming a three plus. And then also boron tends not to do this either, it tends to form cases where it shares electrons through shared electron pairs. Shared electron pairs, again, we haven't like gone through how we know what, you know, how to predict when these compounds form, but they tend to form among the non-metallic elements when they bond with each other. That we have these shared electron pairs, which are just different in nature than ionic bonding. So that's where the electrons are being shared simultaneously between the nuclei, um, as opposed to being donated and shared through um, ionic bonding. Our oxygen group, or let's, say, let's look at our halogen group first. Halogen's one away from the noble gas count like chloride was, Cl to go to Cl minus. So that group all does this where they form the minus one charged ion. Hydrogen can also form a minus one charged ion to come up and, and go towards the helium configuration. So H minus will be hydrogen still with one proton. And minus one means it's picked up one extra electron. So a minus one hydrogen ion would have two electrons. So the net charge of minus one with only one proton to balance that out. And so we're gonna see hydrides can form when you pair that hydrogen up with something like sodium. So sodium hydride, sodium's always a plus, it's never a minus. Hydrogen here therefore has to go to its minus charge state. So that's sodium hydride. We'll talk about nomenclature as we go. If you picked up, the negative ions kind of take the IDE ending. So whenever we're taking like fluorine, throwing the negative charge onto it, we call that fluoride. Cl minus is chloride. We'll talk about the ion nomenclature, the anion nomenclature, after we talk about cation nomenclature. But the cation nomenclature is really simple. It's just sodium cation, potassium cation, rubidium cation. It's just the name of the metal followed by cation. And then when we start naming um, ionic compounds, we're gonna see the ionic compound is always the metal name followed by, or, or the cation name followed by the anion name. So if we look at CaCl2, that this becomes just calcium, because that's calcium two plus, and then we have two chloride ions to balance out the charge. So we have to have, you know, compounds have to be charge neutral. So CaCl2, this just becomes calcium, because that's that ion, it's calcium ion, we leave ion off here. So the name of the compound would be calcium chloride. We take that IDE ending when we have the chlorine in its negative charge state with its common ion of minus one. And we don't need a dichloride to indicate that there's two um, chlorines here because the charge that we know these elements have to have dictates the stoichiometry, the ratio of those ions relative to each other. I need two minuses to balance out the two plus. The compound has to be overall charge neutral. So when we talk about compounds here, a compound's going to be charge neutral. When we get into naming some things that actually have a charge, we'll call those things like naming anions or naming cations. So when we have a, a neutral compound, the charges have to balance out to neutral. So we, a plus two, minus two equals zero for calcium chloride. Um, so the oxygen group, those are all two away from the noble gas count. So those are minus two charged ions. So oxide, sulfide, selenide, and telluride are not used too often in examples. You're gonna see most of your examples in this group would be oxide and sulfide. Nitrogen's common ions of minus three. For nitride, it's three away from the noble gas count. Um, and then everything else, either in the metalloid area, just aren't really forming ionic compounds. They would form shared electron pairs uh, with each other and not form these ionic compounds. But then the transition metals, in this range here, and then also things like lead and tin, these are going to form with a variety of charge states that we can't easily predict. So these do form cations, but with varying charges. 
And then we don't necessarily know just by looking at the placement on the periodic table what the charge is. You know, so for example, if we go to one, two, three, four, five, this is where manganese is. Manganese forms commonly, uh, forms ions commonly with a plus two charge. It can form other compounds with a plus five charge, occasionally with a plus seven charge. We're not gonna have you go through and memorize what charge states are common for each element. What we're gonna try to do is just try to look at this chapter in the section to be, if we give you a compound, we wanna be able to name it. And if we give you a name, we want you to write the formula. Um, so we're not trying to predict what charge states are most stable, uh, which ones are possible. We're just trying to understand that the transition metals are going to form almost all of them with multiple different charge states that aren't easily predictable. Um, and so then we're gonna use a Roman numeral system for us to help understand their charges. And so we're, there's a question on this page, kind of writing all over it. It says, what is the formula for, of the common ion of oxygen and manganese with a plus five charge? So if oxygen has a minus two charge, manganese here is in its plus five charge state, what we'd want to do is balance out the charges. So one way I can do that is have five oxide ions and two manganese cations. This gives me a total of plus 10 from the two uh, manganese ions, and it gives me a total of minus 10 from the oxide ions to balance out the charge. So the formula of that compound would be MN2O5. And then if I said, well, what's the name of it? Like that's the formula for this compound where we have manganese with a plus five charge, oxide uh, with a minus two charge. The name of this compound, we express the charge just as a Roman numeral. So this would be manganese. And then Roman numeral five to indicate its charge state is plus five, and then followed by oxide. So that's all we need to write to express the name for MN2O5. I don't have to call it dimanganese pentaoxide or anything like that. I just go manganese 5 oxide. So my question is, is so when you had said like calcium chloride, we didn't need to write dioxide because it's in the charge. So the reason we don't have to write pentaoxide is because it's in the charge of manganese. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's just like we know oxide's a minus 2. So oxide's the only ion of oxygen that has that charge. You know, so we say oxide, it's O2 minus. There's no other charge state possible for oxygen that we would call oxide. And then manganese 5 is, is Mn5 plus. And so then we're balancing out the charges kind of from there. So we have a relatively early summary slide on naming, but we can kind of wrap up um, our cation nomenclature at this point, and then also just quickly introduce a couple other common ions that we'll recognize uh, with their names. But we have the alkali cations. These are all plus ones. That's just from, like, we're not really memorizing their charges per se. It's all about position on the periodic table. So it's all about recognizing the lithium groups, the first group, they lose an electron. That's why they're plus ones. The alkaline earth cations, those are all two away from the noble gas count. That's why they're all plus two. It's also understanding that it's always plus two for like magnesium. It's always plus one for sodium and never anything else. That's also why we don't call like NaCl will just be sodium chloride, not sodium one chloride, because the charge is understood for sodium to be plus one. So we don't need to use Roman numerals unless we have one of those transition metals where we don't know the charge. Um, Aluminum is always three plus based on its periodic table placement. So we know that one's always a three plus. And then two common ones we see a lot, probably ammonium we'll see in examples more than the hydronium example, but we'll talk about molecular cations on the next slide. But ammonium is just where we have nitrogen with four hydrogens bonded to it. Now I'm showing you the structure here, not so that you understand, not so that you can sketch the Lewis structure yourself, but just so that you can understand that the four hydrogens are connected to what we call molecular bonds or covalent bonds. So this is a molecular cation. And so then this cation here has a positive charge. So it's just a collection of atoms that have those molecular type bonds but where overall the molecule has a charge. And so we call that ammonium. Ions and metals often end in IUM. And so that's hydro, uh, excuse me, ammonium. Hydronium is a, a weird one. This is, I'm, I'm putting this one here because we talk a lot about H plus ions in water as we go throughout the class. Whenever you have an H plus ion in water, that's what we're expressing as hydronium. So that's kind of what hydronium is. It's like an H plus dissolved in water. We write it as H3O plus. 
Um, so sometimes you might hear me say hydronium. You might see this more in Chem 1220 later. So I'm just trying to make sure we lay the groundwork that H3O plus is just like an H plus ion dissolved in water. Um, so we probably won't actually see that. I've never even seen hydronium on an exam, but that's just to introduce an idea of what H3O plus is and how it connects to things you might see later. But our other transition metals, we're just gonna learn the symbol and then the charge expressed as a Roman numeral. So copper two is copper two plus, manganese five, like we saw earlier is manganese five plus, really straightforward for naming transition metals. And then there's a few other ones that I just have on my like, probably not gonna test you on this. In fact, I probably could have put hydronium down here because like I said, I don't think we're gonna really see hydronium on a test. So we might have even thought of putting hydronium down here. But a few things that you might see used like in textbook examples that you might wanna know why uh, we're using examples or what they're all about. Uh, mercury one is really peculiar. So mercury forms a peculiar cation where we have two mercuries bonded together with a two plus overall charge. So this is where two metals are kind of making a molecular type bond, each of them having a positive charge. And so this is what we call, um, like in quotes, mercury one. Because if I had said mercury one, based on our usual nomenclature system, you may have thought that I would have meant mercury plus. But that's not what mercury one is. Mercury one is really HG2, two plus. Now the only reason I bring this up is we talk about mercury one salts in chapter four, you'll see the symbol for HG2, two plus. You might be confused on where that comes from or what that's all about. But this is a special case of mercury where it forms kind of a little molecular unit with an overall two plus charge of two mercuries bonded together. Um, so not a big deal. Probably not something you'll even see on exams for midterm one or even test it at all in terms of nomenclature, but it's an ion you will see later. So I just wanna introduce it here. And I also think it's worth noting that mercury two plus is just the ordinary mercury two plus. So when you see mercury two, that that's just exactly what you would have thought. Mercury with a two plus charge. And so mercury is weird. It forms one ion that's strange and kind of understood that mercury one is HG two, two plus. And then also that mercury two is just ordinary mercury two. And nothing really funny going on with mercury two. For some reason, the book like wants us to know that zinc is always two plus. So it'll call like zinc chloride ZnCl2 without calling that zinc two chloride. I think that's strange to me. I don't know why they do that. But and so, so in some textbook examples and maybe some old exams, I don't think we've tested zinc this way, but we don't put the Roman numeral with zinc. So if I say zinc chloride, you're assuming it's only the two plus. I have no idea why the book does this, but you might see some examples where you don't see the two with zinc. This is why it only forms a plus two cation. Silver plus one is its only cation. So if you see silver chloride, it's AgCl. You just have to understand that silver is only a plus one. Again, something you'll see in examples, probably not tested directly on that nuance. And then mercury two is our common lead ion. We'll see lead in a lot of examples. If you see lead chloride, that's going to be Pb2 plus, so that's PbCl2. So just trying to lay the groundwork for some ions you'll see later in a few conventions that kind of go against what you might have expected their formulas to look like or some of their naming conventions to have been. So a few peculiar cases, but again, not something to worry too much about for exams, but just something to be aware of for some future examples that we'll see. We've already done a bunch of these names, so I think for the most, like we did sodium chloride, magnesium chloride. So again, just remember for this part of the class would be, our nomenclature is always going to be multiple choice. You don't have to even spell, like the department hasn't yet learned that we could have you spell on your exams, but I don't think we wanna go there because spelling's always tricky. So we're not trying to get you kind of caught up between the spelling of these words, but magnesium chloride's the name for MgCl2. Calcium oxide is the name of the next one. Na2O, just sodium. So plus one, two of them, plus two, minus two oxygen. I kind of sometimes do the math below, right? The charges of the ion per ion above. So I like to do per ion above the math below, but this is just sodium oxide. Magnesium nitride, it just maybe gets a little bit trickier when you have a two plus and a nitrogen three minus, but it's only as hard as kind of cross multiplying your charges to get the six plus and then the six minus by having three Mg2 pluses and two and three minuses. 
Sulfate comes up in the next slide, so I guess I'm a little bit ahead of schedule here. So I'll come back to that one after the next slide. And then uh, manganese, we already did, well, we didn't do manganese four oxide. So manganese four is four plus, oxide still at two minus. So if I do this, then I'm gonna just probably cut my subscripts in half. So if I do my cross multiplying trick I did for the Mg3N2, I'm probably gonna wanna divide these both by two to go to MnO2. I could have arrived at this formula here. Also, you know, I could have done this problem a little bit differently. I just wanted to start by showing the cross multiplying on how we want to get the simplest ratio for these ions relative to each other. So another approach I may have taken would have been just to say, okay, a four plus, let me just do one of these, and then I'll do a two to get the balance between a four plus and a four minus. So MnO2 for manganese four oxide, manganese five oxide, we did that one earlier, that was the Mn. 205. So I named a formula, formula to name, not trying to understand why do these formulas exist and not others. That's the, the whole point is just see some formulas, know how to express the formulas if given name, name if given formula. Okay, so polyatomic ions form whenever um, certain groups of elements just want to stick together. Um, and we're not trying to understand why these ions exist, just that they're common, and they're common enough that we want to name them. We'll see them in a lot of different examples. So sulfate um, is the case, we already did um, the ammonium cation earlier, or ammonium um, earlier, but the SO4 two minus is just where we have a central sulfur, we have four oxygens. We can talk Lewis structures later. We can even argue Lewis structures. There's some arguing on what the best Lewis structure looks like, but sulfate kind of just looks something like this. And then somehow this thing overall ends up with the two minus charge. So we end up with the two minus charge on this collection of atoms. And then we see sulfate in compounds. We see it paired up with metal cations. We see it in nature. We have it in our bodies. Um, it's all over the place. We use it as fertilizers too. So it's used in a lot of different type of circumstances. And so the way this balancing would work, the one we skipped earlier was ammonium sulfate. So ammonium's a plus, that's NH4. And then SO4 is a two minus. So to get the balancing right here, what I wanna do is of course double the plus to get plus two. So I now have a plus two minus two. So now I put parentheses around the NH4 to indicate I have two of that formula. And then I don't need parentheses yet around SO4. The only time I need a parentheses is if I have more than one of that ion in the formula. And so notice that I go with two ammoniums as opposed to going N2H8 because N2H8 would probably imply we have a different formula for the ion. This is implying that what I'm going to have, on like imagine one side of the molecule, we have this plus charge interacting with the minus charge, and then maybe on the other side of the molecule, we have the other ammonium. And then really we have that alternating plus minus all throughout the structure. So we just alternate for every anion, we have two cations, and then we would just replicate that structure in three dimensions. So we'd always have plus minus alternating throughout the structure, just more cations in this molecule than anions. So NH42, SO4 is ammonium sulfate. Now, what are some other ions that we wanna learn? And for the most part, hopefully these are things you've seen before, or maybe can recognize some bit of these things, because what we're trying to memorize here, or just try to comprehend, is that for each element, like carbon, the common like, like for sulfate in the previous example too, like the most common count of oxygens and then the charge that we see in nature, we just take that element name and put the ATE ending after it. So if we go to sulfate, four with the two minus charge is just the most commonly or the, what we call the most representative um, anion of this type with, um, with oxygen and sulfur. So that just takes the ATE ending on the root name of sulfur. So that's what we call that one sulfate. Okay, and so then for carbonate, it's three with a two minus. Why is it three and not four? No idea, that's not the point of this topic. Um, the point of this topic is just to recognize three um, oxygens with a two minus charge, that's carbonate, so that's our most representative. Um, these anions are called oxyanions for oxygen um, anions. And so these, uh, the most representative oxyanion of carbon is carbonate. Nitrate, three with a minus, that's nitrate. Phosphate, it's a four with a three minus, that's phosphate and then chlorine, three of them with an overall minus is chlorate. So what we're trying to memorize here 
is how many oxygens are there for the given element, and then what's the charge? And so again, carbonate CO3, two minus, nitrate C, uh, NO3 with a minus, phosphates to three minus, uh, sulfates to two minus, chlorates a minus. So if you go from like P across to sulfur to chlorine, you're kind of dropping in charge from minus three to minus two to minus one. And so then whenever we see like a name, if we said, well, what's sodium chlorate, what's sodium phosphate, what's sodium sulfate, we can write all those formulas very easily, right? So if I said sodium phosphate, you'd say, well, the only thing I need to account for is having three pluses. And then of course, remembering if this is on a test that phosphate has a three minus charge and that there's four oxygens. So Na3PO4 would be sodium phosphate. Um, but sodium chlorate would just be sodium plus ClO3 minus just one to one. So just NaClO3. And so just wedge it as one formula. And so sometimes I like to circle all but the charges just because if I'm writing the formula, I don't include the charges in the formula. So the charges help me with the balancing, but they're not actually part of the express formula. So if I said, like, what's K2CO3, you'd say potassium carbonate. Very simple. And so it's very simple if we know the count of oxygens and the charge of the ion. Then let's talk about a few other conventions. So what if, uh, it, well, this chart here is just kind of summarizing what we just talked about, carbonate, nitrate, phosphate, sulfate, chlorate, and their count of oxygens and charges. And then what if we then compare having the simple ion of an element is just where you have a single atom with its charge based on the prediction on the periodic table. So like chloride Cl minus, oxide O2 minus, nitride N3 minus, those are all the ides. So that's why this is nitride, oxide, et cetera. So our simple ion nomenclature is just IDE endings. And then the oxy anion nomenclature having oxygen attached to one of these ions bearing an overall negative charge, that's where we're using this like eight system like carbonate, phosphate, et cetera. So our most common representative name has the ATE ending after the root name of the element. So for chlorine, again, that would be chlorate, ClO3 minus. What if we take an O away from the formula? Because it turns out that the most common other ions that are similar to these just have a different oxygen count without changing the charge count. So for example, ClO3 minus becoming ClO2 still with a minus charge. And then the only thing we change in the name is we change the name to end in ITE instead of ATE. So ClO2 minus is chlorite instead of chlorate. And if we had SO3 2 minus, that would also be, notice the charge for sulfate was SO4 2 minus. So we didn't change the charge, we just changed the oxygen count. And so this would be sulfite. So drop that oxygen count by one, just go to the ITE ending instead of ATE ending. And if you lose a second O, which this is actually only common, commonly seen for chlorine in the entire group of ions we've seen so far, only really chlorine does this where it loses a second O. And we just put the name hypo out in front. Um, so like sodium hypochlorite is NaClO, ingredient in bleach, really common ion. Um, and so sodium plus ClO minus, this is hypochlorite. And so notice it's just derived off of ClO3 minus, which was an eight, and then to O2 was an eight, which is an one O is hypo. So that's hypochlorite. And what if you add an O? And again, adding an O is really only common for, for chlorine here. So we tend not to see oxygen added to carbonate, nitrate, um, sulfate, or phosphate. It really just chlorate, where we go to ClO4 minus, and so if we go to picking up an extra oxygen but keeping that charge minus, we just put the per out in front. And interestingly though, we do see this with oxide. If you've ever, in, in another common ion of oxygen that we've seen in a lot of like uh, maybe household applications, like thinking of hydrogen peroxide, for example, if I add a second oxygen, then I just use the same nomenclature system. So ClO4 minus is per chlorate, and then O2, adding an O here, this is per oxide. Not the most common example for peroxide in terms of like textbook or exam problem, but something that you'll see in a lot of household examples like these hydrogen peroxide. 
And then also, um, maybe just one worth knowing. We'll see in our summary slide, it's kind of on the list of things that are probably worth knowing, but not necessarily something you tend to see on exams. Okay, so this slide here is just kind of summarizing what we tend to see in nature for carbon is that it only forms the carbonate. And again, I wouldn't memorize that detail. I would just, again, re remind yourself that we're trying to go name to formula, formula to name, not trying to necessarily understand all the nuances of why just these formulas, but I just think it's worthwhile to see that you tend not to see these extra examples for carbon. Nitrates and nitrites are the two common examples of nitrogen. Phosphate, phosphite are the two most common examples you'll see for phosphorus. A lot of different compounds exist with those formulas. Sulfur, same thing. Sulfate, sulfite are common. And then for the chlorine, we tend to see this full range where we get the chlorate, chlorite, hypochlorite ions, and then also the perchlorate ion. Um, oxygen, again, picking up an extra O to go to per, so that was peroxide. And so what's the formula for calcium nitrate? Calcium's a two plus, NO3 is a minus, and so we're gonna have to have two of the nitrate ions, so Ca, NO3, two. And again, parentheses around the NO3 to indicate we have two of the nitrate ions. For Ca3PO42, the only thing maybe worth double checking is that the charges are right, which if they weren't, we wouldn't be able to name this thing. But you know, we may just double check the charges here to see we have a six plus, we have a six minus. And so that's phosphate with the three minuses we expect it to be. So this would just be calcium phosphate. I think the next slide's a summary. Oh, one other, maybe a couple other things before we get to the summary. Um, so what are a few other common ions we tend to see? Well, hydroxide ion is the case of having a hydrogen atom attached to oxygen, so that's hydroxide ion. So that's a really common ion. Of course, it pairs up with H plus or hydronium to make water. So really important reaction there goes on between H plus ions and OH minus ions. And so hydroxide ions, um, the OH minus ion, so calcium hydroxide, of course, is just CaOH2 for two of the minus ions with the one, two plus ion. Acetate's a common ion. We see this in a lot of examples. We see it in a lot of, you know, even household examples using uh, vinegar, for example. Um, but the acetate ion is CH3COO minus. The reason why sometimes you see it expressed this way is it's kind of telling you something about the structure of the molecule being something like this. And then when you have hydrogen attached, we end up making acetic acid. We'll talk about naming acids in a moment. But this molecule here is acetate ion. We also sometimes see it written as C2H3O2 minus, just to kind of make it look like some other ions that we've seen in this chapter. Like a fly flying around the room. Um, and so acetate is just expressed with two different formulas. I like to say that this formula you see more, the C2H3O2 minus, you see more early in Chem 1210. Once we get through structure, you'll see it written more the second way, more the structural way. Um, so potassium acetate is KC2H3O2. And then again, not often tested is the peroxide. Superoxide is where we actually drop the charge. So only in one case do we even see changing the charge. If you look at sulfate, phosphate, phosphite, the ites, eights, the hypos, the pers, we're not changing the charge on the ion from what it originally was. But oxygen, if we drop that charge to minus, that becomes superoxide. Um, these are only forming with certain alkali cations. Don't confuse yourself. Like superoxides and peroxides are kind of rarely formed with certain alkali metals. So these are only forming when you know the charge of the metal that they're pairing up with. So if I see something like TiO2, then I'm not going to confuse myself into this being a peroxide or superoxide because titanium's not an alkali. And so Ti, this is just going to be ordinary minus two for oxide, two of them for minus four. So this is just titanium for oxide and not a peroxide or superoxide. <coughs> So peroxide, superoxide is worth knowing. We'll see them maybe in some examples and at different points in the class, but probably not something you'll see naming too much. 
So if you see a compound and you think it's one of those, it probably isn't. The only time it really has to be is if you have something like KO2 or KO2 where you know the charge of the metal and you know there's a plus two. So this is the peroxide because we have O2 with an overall minus two charge. And then the second example, we know potassium is a plus. The metal is always plus here. And so that's O2 with an overall minus one charge for the two oxygens. So that's the superoxide. So the only time you'll have these compounds and examples is when you know the charge of the metal based on its placement on the periodic table. Okay. I think the summary's next. Okay, I was right. Um, so the summary of, of the anion nomenclature um, kind of goes like this. So we have hydride, um, hydrogen in its negative charge state. We have the halides, minus ones, oxide sulfides, minus two. We could have included selenide and telluride, but again, not common in examples. Nitride N3 minus, phosphides here, never really use phosphide in examples, so it doesn't really need to be on this list. So really nitride's the only common ion with a minus three charge. Hydroxide, acetate, and then we see carbonate, um, nitrate. The, the red versus the black font here, the red font is kind of where we're trying to use a system to get the name. And then the black font's just where we have to memorize. And so the same thing on the cation nomenclature system was true too. So these are all just named by convention on the periodic table. These hydroxide, acetate, carbonate, nitrate, sulfate, phosphate, et cetera, those all have to be just memorized. But then the system for naming nitrite, phosphite, sulfite is very systematic. So if you learn the system, you're not necessarily individually rememorizing PO3, three minuses, phosphate. It really is just, if you know PO4, three minuses phosphate, then you know what phosphite is by convention. So hopefully it's knowing the conventions here. And then I don't think we'll test too much the superoxides and peroxides, but again, I think it's kind of worth seeing here. Okay, so let's get into another category of compounds. And sometimes it's useful to take a step back and say, you know, when you see KCl versus when you see HCl, do we see two different totally classes of compounds? You know, because when I look at KCl, I see an ionic compound. And when I look at HCl, I see a molecular compound. Now, for your, you guys may not see it as, as I do, um, because maybe you haven't seen enough examples yet, but these are all non-metallic elements. When I have non-metals, they just don't bond in the way that the ionic compounds do. So H isn't really gonna be a plus and a minus in this compound. Instead, hydrogen's going to have to share an electron pair with chlorine. That gives it a totally different set of properties to where KCl is that alternating plus minus plus minus. The net impact this has is that KCl has a melting point of like 800 degrees C. It's a solid up to like very, very high temperatures. HCl um, boils at like minus probably 150 degrees C. It has a melting point, boiling point well below room temperature because it has such a weak set of attractive forces between its molecules because it's not forming those high charged plus and minus charged ions. So shared electron pairs, molecular compounds, totally different set of properties. And so when we look at HCl, one of the important things I want to see is that we're not naming it like KCl. So we're going to name it as a different category of compound. Now we're going to then name it for something that's also hard to understand at this point because we're not really even understanding what an acid is. Other than here, we're going to try to see acids or when anions have been neutralized with H plus ions. And the implication will be later, we'll see, that when you put an acid in water, it can release the H plus ion. So the whole idea of HCl, we put this into water, then it can release some ions. And then that gets into the topic of how many ions, is it a strong acid or is it a weak acid? That's a chapter four topic. So for now, what I want us to picture is any anion we learned how to name, be it chloride, neutralize it with H plus, means go to a neutral charge with H plus ions, that's HCl. This is named as an acid. So we go to the root name of the acid being chloride. So we call it hydrochloric acid is the systematic name whenever the original ion that had been neutralized was an ied ion. And so then if you see HClO3, I think you could agree that if we also called that hydrochloric acid, we'd have a problem. We want different formulas that have different names. And so to come up with a different name for a different formula, what we do is we look at ClO3, that's chlorate. So eight ions go just to ic acid. So we drop the hydro, and so we would just call this one chloric acid, and we call this one hydrochloric acid, HCl hydrochloric acid, HClO3, just chloric acid.
And so eights go to ic acid without the hydro out in front. And then the ite ions, if we had HClO2, that would be um, chlorite having been neutralized with H+, we call that chlorous acid. So OUS acid, so that would be chlorous acid. If you have HClO, hypochlorous acid. So you just kind of look at an ion. Um, there's some examples down here. Um, then hopefully we can name that ion. So for example, HF, let's do the formula to name. So it's this picture, what's the underlying ion? It's fluoride in the case of HF. So that's hydrofluoric acid. And again, don't worry about spelling. This isn't a spelling class. You have multiple choices to pick up names. We're not trying to get the nuances of spelling fluorine and all those hard to spell elements. Um, HF's a nasty acid. Like if you ever come across this in the lab, make sure you know how to use it before you use it. Take incredible safety precautions. Who's seen Breaking Bad? Do you guys know the scene I'm talking about? I mean, like that is a absolutely true scene. Like, like if you get even a relatively small amount of HF on your skin, you could die because it eats through to the bone and causes such a severe uh, reaction of the nervous system that um, that's very deadly. So be very careful with HF. Uh, so sometimes I like to make sure that we write a form, just because we know the name of a compound doesn't mean it's safe to work with, right? So hopefully we can portray that message um, that some compounds are gonna be hazardous to work with, even if we know their names. Uh, H2SO4, what's the underlying ion? So what ion had been neutralized with H plus? So it would have been SO4 two minus. So if we have SO4 two minus, it just takes two H pluses to neutralize the charge. That's how we come up with H2SO4. And so having two hydrogens doesn't need to be part of the nomenclature system because everybody knows sulfate has a two minus charge. So we just only go the eight to ick. So this would be sulfate to sulfuric acid. Do you notice the weird thing with sulfur, how it went from sulfate, not sulfurate, and then sulfuric goes to sulfuric. So you see how the root name sometimes is extended or shortened depending on the name. Again, don't worry about that detail. We're not testing you on where do you abbreviate a root name and how does that little nuance change. Um, I think we've seen sulfuric acid before, not too hard to pick up that we just are naming the full element name for the acid form there. And if we go to H2SO3, SO3 to minus is sulfite. So that would be sul fur and then OUS acid. There is a space between the name here and the acid. So sulfurous space acid. And then notice it's OUS acid, so sulfurous acid. Hydro, hydroiodic acid, which actually is more commonly called hydroiodic acid. There's a lot of times you'll see names are kind of weirdly edited when you have multiple vowels in a row. But don't worry about that nuance either. Just pick up the hydro and then iodine and the ic acid. So hydro um, iodic acid is the iod ion. So it's HI because iodide is I minus. So hydroic acid is the name for HI. Phosphoric acid would be the, the ic acid is for the eight. So the phosphate is PO4, three minus. And so phosphoric acid is H3PO4. Nitrous must be off of nitrite, which is NO2 minus, because NO3 minus was nitrate. So this would be just HNO2. So it might be worth mentioning that when we look at something like, I think, well, okay, we'll do this problem in a second. Uh, when we see an ion like HSO3 minus, how do we name that thing? Or when we see something maybe more common like HCO3 minus, how do we name this thing? Well, you may be looking at this thing saying, well, those are acids because they can still lose H plus in water. So can we name those some kind of acid in the and the acid nomenclature system is only naming neutral molecules in that nomenclature system. And one of the more nuanced details is when we name things here in chapter two, we're naming charge neutral molecules where we see H plus having neutralized an acid. Fully, we're naming those as acids. These here we're gonna name as still being anions. We're gonna see a slide on these in a minute. So if you were wondering, how do you name something where we haven't fully neutralized the charge, that'll come up in a slide or two from now.
Um, the system will actually be very simple. This, is, this will just be hydrogen carbonate ion, hydrogen sulfite ion. So it's gonna be a very simple nomenclature system. I just want to point out right now that these are actually still acids. You can think of them as being acids. If you've had an AP program or a really good high school chemistry class, you may be saying, well, those are acids. Why aren't we naming them as acids? It's just a nomenclature system at this point. We'll pick up more of the nuanced details as we continue. Okay, so I think we're gonna end up skipping the survey today. There is a survey, if anybody wanted to leave feedback um, on the survey, the key word for today is acid, but we're gonna just do this problem here together. Um, so if you wanted to do the survey just to throw in the feedback or questions you have for today, feel free. Um, you don't have to answer this question online though, that's fine. So which of these names is incorrect? And let's try to think about why they might be incorrect. And so let me start with B here. So chlorous acid, that would be HClO2, right? Because chlorite is ClO2 minus, so chlorous acid would be HClO2. Acetic acid, acetate is C2, H3O2, so acetate is this, and eights go to ic acid. So acetic acid really is just H plus added on to that acetate formula. So this is indeed acetic acid, so that's correct. Bromic acid, um, or excuse me, hydrobromic acid, the hydro in front implies that we had Br minus, an atomic ion of the IDE ending, which would be Br minus is bromide. So hydrobromic acid would be HBr. So that checks out. Phosphoric acid, I think we did this on the previous slide. But H3PO4, that's definitely the formula, formula for phosphoric acid. And then this is the one, of course, that's wrong. So this should be H2SO4. So SO4 is sulfate. So sulfuric acid would be H2SO4, not H2SO3. So that would be our incorrect one. So there's a couple relatively simple nomenclature systems I want to try to make sure to get through today so we can kind of move off the topic of naming um, and get into chapter three next time. But the nomenclature system I was beginning to get into on the previous slide of where do you still have an anion once you start neutralizing some charge. Like for example, carbonate being neutralized with two H pluses, which is really hydronium we were talking about earlier, that leads to H2CO3, that's carbonic acid. Very simple nomenclature system for naming that acid. And so when we still have an anion, when you just have one H plus added, so imagine instead of having two H plus neutralizing the two minus carbonate, we only have one. There we stop at what's still an anion, so we still name it for being an ion, so it still has the name carbonate in its name, and we just add the word hydrogen out in front. So we call that the hydrogen carbonate ion for HCO3 minus, but that's commonly used in like baking powder, um, and so KHCO3 for potassium hydrogen carbonate, so KHCO3, so again, this is the minus, this is a plus, so potassium hydrogen carbonate. And so, not too many examples you'll see on exams. This is actually something we rarely examine, so I don't know if I'd worry too much about this, but you'll see them in examples. It might be worth thinking about these things existing so that we can understand when we see them being written later. In like Chem 1220, if you've never seen this before, you'll talk about H3PO4 going to H2PO4 minus, and H2PO4 minus going to HPO4 two minus, and kind of writing out all these different acid steps. But so if we go through this with phosphate, so phosphate's a three minus. If you add an H+, plus, you go to hydrogen phosphate ion. If you add a second H+, plus, you call that dihydrogen phosphate, still an ion, so we're still calling that a name based on phosphate. And then if you add the third H+, plus, notice we fully neutralize at that point, then that's when we go and name the thing by being an acid. So that's what we call phosphoric acid. Now, these things here, you can still think of them as being acids. They're just not being named in the category of systems for being acids. They're still anions, so they still have that phosphate ending and their name. So if I said, you know, what's potassium, like what's the name of this for KH2PO4? H2PO4 had two H pluses added to PO4 three minus, so that's H2PO4 with a minus. Potassium, of course, is always a plus. So this would just be potassium and then dihydrogen phosphate. 
So I don't know if I've said this before. I don't get to write the exams for the class. They're written by committee. The committee almost never puts this category on the exam. So I'll, again, this is probably a category of something worth seeing and understanding, but probably not something you'll actually see on exams or on too many practice um, items. I think they're on some of my daily quizzes because I think this is worth going over and reviewing and understanding, uh, but probably not something you'll see on exams. And I am mentioning that because I'm kind of going quickly through this. If you're wondering why I'm flying off this onto the next, it's for that reason. Okay, so for those, like how, like, how many of you guys do not need to take organic chemistry? It's actually more hands than I expected. So I mean, understanding some bit of understanding of organic molecules I think is useful because a lot of people, probably two thirds plus of the class um, will go on to take OCHEM. Um, so getting into naming some basic organic compounds I think is always useful. And so hydrocarbons are where we just kind of name the basic saturated hydrocarbon. So what's a saturated hydrocarbon? Well, carbon can be saturated with four bonds. And if you do it with hydrogen, that's our saturated hydrocarbon. And so having one carbon um, saturated with hydrogen, hydro, uh, carbon can form four bonds. If I teach you nothing for OCHEM to prepare you, carbon always has four bonds, never five, never three in a stable molecule. Uh, if you write those on a test, your organic TA will always get upset and, and mark your papers off like you're insane or something, but carbon forms four bonds, whether it's through double bonds, two of them, a double and two singles, you, know, you can picture those later when you get to OCHEM, but four single bonds with hydrogen are what we get for one single carbon, that's called methane. If we add a second carbon, notice that each carbon still has four bonds, and it's just they're now having two bonds with carbon atoms and the rest with hydrogen, so the formula here would be CH3, CH3, that's ethane, so we just have to understand methane's one carbon, ethane's two carbons, propane's three carbons, and so propane's having three carbons. Notice CH3 is on the end, CH2 in the middle, um, so that's propane is C3H8 is what that works out to. So what I would be just kind of picturing is if I had to come up with the count of hydrogens on propane, I'm just filling in my diagram here with like four total bonds per carbon and then counting up CH3, CH2, CH3 for eight total hydrogens. Butane, and just where we have four carbons. So if you have four carbons in linear sequence, we're just naming or counting the hydrogens accordingly. So we're gonna have CH3, CH2, 2, CH3. So notice we have CH3s on the end, CH2s in the middle, just two CH2s in the middle. And so that's going to be three plus two, and then plus three plus two again, so that's C4H10. So coming up with the hydrogen count to me is nothing more harder than four carbons connected and then give four total bonds per carbon with hydrogens for the remaining spots. So we're just filling in hydrogens here in these spots if you wanna complete the structure just to show the hydrogens. And so those are just pure memorization, right? But I think we've seen methane before, ethane before, maybe pro propane and butane. Students get backwards a lot. Last semester I was actually surprised. The class did very badly just on a question of what the formula of butane was, even though I thought it was a very straightforward question. Um, pentane through decane are pretty easy because it just becomes penta for five, hexa for six. We just use these Greek prefixes um, from five on forward. So pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, decane, just through 10 are what we hope that you know. And so like for example, octane would be the C8 variant of the hydrocarbon. So then how many hydrogens would be attached? Well, the, this is really nothing harder, I think, than CH3. CH2 and then CH3, and then how many CH2s do we have in the middle would be six. So we have the two carbons on the end, six in the middle give us eight total carbons. And then if we add up 12 times six, or uh, uh, six times two, that's 12, plus three plus three, that's 18 hydrogens. And so if you notice, it's always gonna be the number of carbons times two and then plus two. So you get like the extra two hydrogens on the end. I think that's written here. So CN, H, 2N plus 2. I don't know if I'd memorize that formula as much as I just memorized kind of putting the carbons together. You know, like worst case scenario, just put eight carbons in linear sequence. If this is like on a test, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then you're just filling in the hydrogens, right? Very easy. And you can label hydrogens if you want, count them up, and you should come up with C8H18.
And so for C6, that would be C6H14 for hexane. What about alcohols? I think this is really important, right? Because methanol is uh, toxic. Don't drink methanol. Um, if you do, drink some methanol because it actually turns out ethanol is a competitive um, uh, inhibitor for methanol in the body. So if you mistakenly drink methanol, you should probably quickly drink some methanol. Uh, but again, ethanol is toxic too. It's just you can drink a little more ethanol than methanol. Um, so, so yeah, don't drink methanol. So it's, I think it's good to know the formula methanol. Methanol is just the alcohol of methane. So the alcohol of methane is where we replace one of the hydrogens with a hydroxyl group. And any one of the hydrogens we replace gives us the same compound of methanol. You replace any of these hydrogens, just one of them, with a hydroxyl group. You can pick any one of those spots, you get the same molecule. We might need to learn a little bit about structure to see that for sure, but that's ethanol. And replace any of these positions with a hydroxyl group, we get the molecule we would call propanol. And so notice the number here. Don't worry about the number. We're not going to worry about numbering one versus two propanol. That would be naming like n-propanol versus isopropanol. And so um, those are the alcohols. So if we had butane or hexane or hexanol, you can just go from the formula of the one to the alcohol. Let's do hexane, C6H14. In the alcohol form, we just lose one of those. We go to H13 and then add the hydroxyl group. So hexanol would be C6H13 with a hydroxyl group in one of the spots on any of the positions on that hydrocarbon. And I just end on this slide here that kind of shows the difference between one versus two propanol to show we're not going to worry about numbering which one's one versus two propanol. So don't worry about the numbering system for naming alcohols. Just learn that those are both what we would call isomers of propanol. They're the same formula, but different compounds to have slightly different properties. But the whole idea here, just express the big formula. Be able to express like decane C10 H22, the alcohols H21 hydroxyl group, H21 OH. All right, guys, there's just one category we'll name next time. We'll pick up from there, get into chapter three, get into some review topics for the end of the week into Monday for midterm one. All right, guys, have a great day.